Hey, what's going on? Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Life at Crossroads podcast. You know, no matter what stage of life you are in, we all, we tend to find ourselves at a crossroads, right? Always. That's, that's what this podcast is about. Um, my name is Mark Johnson. I'm the lead pastor of Crossroads Church in Oklahoma City. With me, I have Pastor Adam. He is our youth pastor. And th the purpose of this podcast is to really cover a variety of topics because life is not, you know, it's not just singular focused. We've got a lot of things that happen in our lives. I know mine's not. No. <laughs> No. I think if your life is too singular, you're doing something wrong. I mean, yeah, you need to get a little more. You know, get a little spice in your get life. Get a little spice in your life. <laughs> so the purpose of the podcast is to talk about life's many, many uh, different topics. So let's jump into what we're going to talk about. Um, we are currently doing a in-depth Bible study mm -hmm. in the collected works of Luke and Acts. So we stopped at Luke chapter 3, 4 last week. I have to give a disclaimer. Last week, I brought up a theory, a theory that the young man uh, in John's gospel, when Jesus says, I am he, and it knocks the Roman soldiers to the ground, yeah. there is this theory that a, you know, a concussive force of creative miracle working power exuded or emitted from Jesus and there's a young man who's John talks about is found in his naked or <laughs> naked jakey, as you yeah, say, or booty. his nudie booty. That's it. <laughs> um, found in his grave clothes. And, and I postulated that it might be Luke, but actually the theory is not Luke. It's John Mark. Mm. So I always get those two mixed up when it comes to this story. I always want to think it's Luke, but actually it's John Mark. Um, but still, it was kind of a you know neat thread to go down. And, oh yeah. And to oh try yeah. To, I'm always down for talking about a character in the Bible who's running away from something naked. <laughs> How <laughs> he, many are He those? has the youth pastor How on. How many you know, Yeah, that's gonna... the youth that you can take the the youth out of the pastor. You can't take the well, you can take the pastor out of the youth, but not the youth out of the pastor. Come on. You know. There yeah. we go. Um, yeah, do we need to list all the? <laughs> no, no the, let's the not. Too many pop hot and come to mind. But which reminds you of a story. Uh, the way I used to illustrate uh, the the parable of the, the lost son, where the son the father sees the son far yeah, off yeah, and he yep. he runs. Yep. Um, you know, typically, you know, we hear the expression "gird your loins." Yes. Which. You can look it up. There is a way to gird your loins. The right way and the wrong the way. The proper way, which girding your loins means, if you don't know what that means, is, you know, obviously ancient tunics go all the way down to the ankle. So in order to be able to run, <laughs> you've got to pull up and, and to where you're turning your long um, United Pentecostal skirt into a mini skirt <laughs> from the 1960s. You got, you got to hike it up, to baby. Free, to free your legs. And then you tie it with your belt, which is girding your loins. But the illustration I give is the father doesn't have time to do that, so he hikes his his skirt up like an old grandma, and, you know, and gets a little hitch in his giddy yeah. up, so to speak. So that's a good visual. There you go. I see uh, it right. Here. Anyway, okay, we are we've gotten off track, so let's we are going to take a pause from jumping into the book and the chapters uh, in the book of Luke. This past Sunday, I did a message on. Leadership by the Spirit. And it's a hot button topic that's going on in our nation today. And we're specifically talking about the role of female leadership in the church. Now, mm -hmm. to give some context here, a month ago, the month of June, the United, the United, the Southern Baptist Convention met all their leadership and they amended their governing documents to restrict, to further restrict the role of women in leadership mm -hmm. in the Southern Baptist Convention. So where they came down on it is women are not allowed to be elders or pastors of any kind. It's quite a bold In the move, SBC. <laughs> it's, it's, it's strong salt. Woo! It's strong salt, yeah, yeah. you know. And so the fallout from that, from my research, and this is by no means comprehensive or exhaustive, but a total of, I think, five Mega churches have been removed, including Saddleback Church, uh, which is Rick Warren's church. Mm -hmm. a, uh, another mega church, which 
is Elevation Church in North Carolina, Stephen Furtick's church, mm-hmm. that they left voluntarily. They removed themselves. And a document, a 200-some page document, listing 170 churches with female ordained pastors of some kind that are to be, have been, or already have been, or are being purged, being removed from the fellowship. So mm. it is, it's it just, it's crazy, it's creating a bit of a ripple. So this is an, the topic of female leadership within the church is nothing new. Right, Pastor Adam? It's it's No, 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 no. It's, it, it's nothing new. I, I was going to... I don't want to like jump ahead or get off go topic. Ahead, go but ahead. No, I, jump, I was jump. wondering if Feel you'd be free. willing to... Frog hop this thing. I, I want to... I want you know, my mind can't help but wonder why. Do you know what I mean? Because it's not like they're going um, to a stronger degree in the same direction they've been moving. They have stopped and reversed... And my mind is like, are they are they knee jerk well, reacting to like the culture that they feel uh, is going too I hard one way? That I think that's uh, there's a couple things, and and these are just my thoughts. Number one, that is a factor. Mm-hmm. Number two, there's there was always this undercurrent of you know some do it, but you really shouldn't. Uh, like a yeah. So yeah. they're they're trying to codify gotcha. their beliefs. But the third thing, and this is the most I think the most important, you have a struggle, not just in the Southern Baptist Convention, um, because this is not meant to be disparaging against the Southern Baptist right, Convention, because right, right, right. they're they're wrestling with this old issue like everybody else yeah. is, uh, and they're wrestling with culture, and they're wrestling with everything, and this issue that I'm about to bring up, they're wrestling with it like everybody else is, every other church in America. I think it's more indicative of a struggle of um, an kind of that older generation, that more traditional yes way of doing things with a new generation yeah 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 yeah. and that is the struggle in fact over the last 20 30 years my from my research once again it's not exhaustive or comprehensive Mm -hmm. from what i'm seeing non-denominational churches the majority of them are southern baptist in roots now you Mm. say well how do you know this number one everybody should know this there's no such thing as a non-denominational church no such thing. Even if a church has no denominational ties, they have a denominational and a theological framework. If you want to know, if you attend a non-denominational church and you want to know what denomination you are close, most closely linked with, go to your church's website, pull up the bio on your senior past, pastor, and find out where he got his education. Oh, that's good. Then you know Some detective what, work. Yeah. No, that's what, smart. That's that's super smart. Your theological framework. And most of the non a lot of the non denominational churches that are out there have a lead pastor who comes from a Southern Baptist roots. And I've talked with a lot of pastors of a lot of non denominational churches. A lot of them come from the SBC. And the struggle is not it's not about women in ministry or anything like that. It's just the struggle between traditionalism and kind of modernism. Yeah. Um, and you see that in Assemblies of God as well. We are an Assembly of God church. You see that definitely in your more mainline denominational um, churches. So let's jump back onto the subject of women in leadership. Now, right. I do have to say this, uh, Pastor Adam, that we are an Assembly of God church, Assemblies of God. They do ordain and credential pastors. They do allow um, female pastors to be um, to to be lead pastors. In fact, a good friend of mine I graduated high school with, she was a year in front of me, is a pastor. I may I may call her and do an interview. You should. She's a female lead pastor of a church in Southern Illinois, and um, she does a podcast mm-hmm. and talks about. It's called the Preacher Chick, I think. Um, shout out to Stacy Wampler, not Stacy. That's her maiden name. Oh, look at that! Means that they go Wilson. way back, way back. They're, they're OG. Sorry, Stacy Stacey Wilson. She's been Stacy Wilson for twenty something years. <laughs> so, but Stacy Wilson. Um, but so can you can so, you just reiterate for me really quickly what, no. what their ruling was? <laughs> Stop it. Who's the SBCs? SBC yeah, was like they can have no leadership. From my understanding, um, females cannot be a pastor of any kind, of any kind, or an elder, which is a specific kind. I'm sure. 
that they will allow women to be a director, like a children's ministry director, mm-hmm. women's ministry director or coordinator, but they cannot hold the office or the title of pastor. You know what I mean? It starts to get a little muddy. I, I don't it know. Does. When you start to get into it. Can it can be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. But one thing I've got to say this, I'm, you know, I grew up Pentecostal. Mm-hmm. I cut my teeth on Pentecostal pews. Um, gifts of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. speaking in tongues were as common to me as past the cereal. Right, you know? right, right. And I am very grateful for this for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, I get to grow up in a denomination, in a fellowship that allows space for women to be leaders. Yeah. And... I get to be part of a history, um, church history, a segment of church history. When, when I mean that, I mean the the Pentecostal movement. If you look through the pages of church history, anytime you have a movement that the giftings of the Holy Spirit are prominent. Mm-hmm. Now, we're not talking just in America, but we're talking overseas. Mm-hmm. Anytime you have a revival where the giftedness, where giftedness is the forefront, yeah. not individual, but gifted, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. gifts of the Holy Spirit, then minorities and females naturally rise to the top. They mm. naturally rise to places of leadership because the Holy Spirit moves upon whom the Holy Spirit chooses. He don't discriminate. He doesn't. And that's, right. you know, you see that through the pages of the Bible. You see that through uh, the pages of history. Mm. You know, the charismatic renewal. You see that the Great Awakening, or the Second Great Awakening. You see that um, as Pentecostal has been on the rise, South America, um, the the role of female leadership in Pentecostal churches in South America is just exploding um, all over the, the world. We mm-hmm. see this, and we get to be a part of this tradition, which yeah. I really yeah, like. So, cool. okay, I'm talking a lot, and we're... We're not getting to the topic. So Circle in the wagon. Here's the, we, we bring it in, rain it in, Adam. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So the goal of today is, um, you know, we and work as we go through Luke, we're going to see example after example after example of female leadership in the New Testament mm-hmm. church. However, you have the writings of Paul. And we talked a little bit about this on, on Sunday. In, in my message, um, check out our website, crosswords.church. You'll see it in the archives. Um, watch it. It's, it's, I think it's a good watch. But you have the writings of Paul. So how do we wrestle with Lucan theology and Pauline theology? How do we address what Paul is talking about? Specifically, the one that really gets me is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, or really 7 through 15. Um, so we'll start with that one, and because um, some of them, you know, like in Ephesians, uh, it, it talks mainly about the relationship between husband and wife. So, okay. um, so let me give if I if I can. I'm just sorry. I'm talking. Adam's not talking. <laughs> no, no, no. I listen, I'm. I'm. Yes. So if I can give kind of my highlight, my yeah, my nutshell yeah, yeah, of yeah. where I fall in on this. Okay, let's start there. I am not. A hundred percent egalitarian, and mm-hmm. I am not a hundred percent complementarian. Mm-hmm. If I tend to lean on the spectrum, I lean a little more towards egalitarianism. Okay, which if you don't know what that means, a uh, viewer out there, complementarianism is the belief that women were created to complement, to be a support, to be a help, and to be fully in submission to men. So in the church, leadership is reserved for men. Mm-hmm. Egalitarianism is the belief that. Women and men are completely equal in the home and on the job site and in the church. So I think the answer to this lies in the middle. There's a balance to this. So leadership stems in the home, the marriage relationship. God has called the male to be the head of the home and the high priest of the home beginning in the marriage. So we got to start from there. Word of God says this, and we've got to wrestle with it. What does that mean? It's not a position of authority. It's not a position of privilege. There is authority there, but it's more of a the buck has to stop somewhere. Yeah. The responsibility and the onus has to land on one pair of shoulders, and that's the man's. So if your family falls apart, men, God is not going to look to your wife and go, what did you do or didn't do? He's going to look to you. And you can't say, just like he looked to Adam, Right. And he said, it's the woman you gave me. Right. It's her fault. He said, no, 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 no. It's yours because I've placed you in this position of leadership. The onus is on you. So it stems from there. So the core of church leadership, 
should always be um, strong, spirit-led, grace-filled male leadership. That's the core Mm -hmm. of it. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. But there is example after example after example after example of female leadership, even female leadership um, in certain situations that is over authority over males. So the thought is, as I lead Crossroads Church and as pastors lead a church, Mm -hmm. they should challenge and expect male leadership to rise, but always leave the door open for female leadership. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. There's not a glass ceiling. Yeah. Women, the Holy Spirit moves upon whom he wants to. Holy Spirit promotes and elevates women. And if God promotes a woman to be a pastor and have authority over a, a, a male then yeah, we leave the door open for that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that... um, The the core is still going to be men in leadership and and should be because men should step up and lead because leadership in the church should be an outflow of leadership in the home. No, I think putting it in that context, starting with the home, really simplifies it. You know what I mean? It doesn't simplify it, but it it puts it in a perfect context for me. Yeah. Because it's not, you know, like, like at our home... Um, when it comes down to it, the decision is going to lie with me. Like you said, it's a heavy responsibility. It's a larger weight. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not that my wife can't do anything and everything. Cause believe me, she does. Yeah. You know what I mean? But when it comes down to it, it's just, I, there has to be a head of the household. You can't have two captains of that ship. And that falls to the men, to the male. That's, yeah. And that's me. And I, and I think that, um, taking the home and then transferring it to the church, which is completely relatable. I think that's. That's a perfect way to explain that. And I think one of the reasons why we have heartburn around this issue is because of a lack of male leadership in our in the church. And I mean the church as a whole. Yeah. I think if we truly had grace-filled, Holy Spirit-led and empowered male leadership in our church, we wouldn't be having the heartburn that we have. And but here's the thing. You think we have like a bunch of insecure or not enough, like male both, leadership, and both. it's causing all of the above, all of the above. Because the thing is, the natural reaction to what I just said is, so Mark, what are you saying that if we had good, solid male leadership, there would be no need for female leadership? That's not what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, no, 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 not at all. I'm saying good, spirit-filled, spirit-led, empowered, grace-filled male leadership um, cultivates, gives room for. And is not scared by strong female leadership. Right. Absolutely not. A a core of strong male leadership creates a framework of safety for female leadership to flourish. Right. Right. uh, That makes sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it it should, we should be providing the base as, as husbands, as fathers. We should be providing the shoulders for our daughters and sisters to stand upon. Absolutely. As a father, yeah, my daughter, and you know my daughter, she is a strong-willed, <laughs> yeah. you know, she is off the scales on being strong She's a strong go-getter, willed. yeah. She's a go-getter. As a father, I pour into that. Yes, I feed lean that. into that. Yes. I feed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? You don't, you don't pull the reins in on that no, because you're and, a secure father. And I don't teach my daughter to be submissive to her future husband in the sense of, you know, killing and crushing her spirit. What I have to do is talk to her about partnership. You're, you're going to fall in love with the man. Yeah. And he's called to be the high priest of your home. And you have dreams and vision that God want you to fill out. So you guys have to find a way to partner together. Can, can, can I, to can I ask, let me ask you this. Do yeah. You, do you think that this is like a broader, bigger picture? Just because you said two words right there that I think a lot of people will be like, I don't want no part of that. What does submission to authority? Yeah, now, I think that this is a larger problem, not even in just the the female male context. Me? But you know what I mean? Like people have a problem submitting <sighs> let's, to authority. Well, in let's general. be honest. Yes, that in general. Let's be honest. We are Americans. Independence is like been rugged, bred into rugged us. individualism is baked in. Nobody tells us what to do. Unless it's us. And I don't think that's a good thing. Well, it's a good thing. It is a good thing. And it can be a bad thing, though. 
It's a good yes. thing, which in the sense that it helped us build this nation that we have. Right. It's a bad thing if it goes to extremes. There's balance. Everything is balanced. Yeah, Everything yeah, yeah, is balanced. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes, rugged individualism is is baked in. And if you actually look in Ephesians where it says, wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives, it is within the broader context of submit one to another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah of yeah. mutual submission. Yes. And really submission to the Spirit of God and, and to the Word of God. And uh, that's, you know, all leadership should start with submission to the Word of God and and the leading of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. regardless if it's male or female leadership or whatever context, be it in the church or in the home or in the marriage, it all starts with submission, mutual submission to the Spirit of God. And I think that's where we get off yeah. right off the Woo! bat. Yeah, I mean we're we're fouling out right, yep. you know, yeah. out the gate. Yeah. So um, I have no clue what time it is. Our producer Brian's going to have to keep us on track because <laughs> I did not do my timer this. So let's. Ten, we got 10 minutes left? Right, okay, so we may ha- just have time to deal with this one. Okay. Let me pull up the verse here. Oh, it's a spicy one. Um, we're going to start with verse 11. <laughs> First Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. I'm reading ESV. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first... Then Eve and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. All right, Pastor Adam, how do we unpack this little nugget? You're going to make me go first on this one, huh? Yes, I am. I've got some thoughts. (laughs) I want to throw you out to the lion's den first. So, uh, the the question is, I mean, here's the thing. Like, how do you how do you reconcile this to the rest of well, the rest of scripture? Well, to what Luke, you know, presents in the book of Acts and the book of Luke to all the examples of female leadership. How do we reconcile this with uh, the rest of the Gospels? Mark very much presences women. John as well. Um, Some even are argue more than Luke, but I think overall, pound for pound, Luke it, is you yeah. know, prevalent. But in the rest of Scripture, you know, characters like Deborah and Esther, how do we reconcile with the rest of Scripture? Okay, I'm, I'm going to preface this with, I absolutely agree with you that there needs to be a healthy balance, that the yes. truth is found in the middle, right? Sure. So when I first start reading this, uh, at the very beginning of what Paul's saying, I start to think like he's he's talking about a cultural specific thing right at the beginning which he is at the beginning i mean he is. but then but then where it gets tricky for me where it gets hard is then he goes to a super general statement bringing in adam and eve that seems to cover everybody so all of a sudden i'm like this can't necessarily directly apply to simply the church in ephesus because he just he just took it out to like all women do you know what i mean and so um I know a lot of people will read things like you mentioned in Sunday, and they'll want to say that um, in a lot of the epistles and what Paul is saying, like, well, that only applied to that church. Right. And then a lot of people will want to read something and say, like, hard line, that is everybody, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. And again, I, I, I got to think that the truth is in the middle, because if you have two scriptures, like you say, that are seemingly contradictory, scripture doesn't contradict itself, so now you just got to try and wrestle with these and find... The balance in the middle. I will use a reference, okay? Um, and I heard this, uh, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but when you get into like Levitical law, right? Mm. Ooh, I've, I've, Levitical I've, law. One way, down. one way that I've that I've um, heard people say that you can interpret some of these things, and I know that you can kind of get into a danger zone, is that you can look at some of these things as cultural laws, and then there are universal laws. Right, okay. like when you get into head coverings and gold earrings and trimming your beards, if you take that as a universal law, all of a sudden we're all outside of that today. Agreed. A lot of those are cultural laws, but then you can take some of them as universal laws that should be adhered to, that can't be broken there for everybody. And I think that this kind of lies in the middle of those two, cultural and universal. Well, how about what do you think? Uh, no, I I agree because I think. There is, I've heard this, you know, the way of interpretation scripture, mm-hmm. uh, interpreting scripture this way, I would classify it as you have un, you have cultural laws mm-hmm. and then you have the universal heart behind the laws. Mm-hmm. So 
Like, for instance, um, when you back up to verse 9, likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, um, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire. Now, let's look at this. No, no, no. That, that's, a, that's a perfect example. Perfect example. You can't braid your hair. Right. That's cultural. Very of the cultural. time. Like right. something was going on sure. where that represented you something else. You can't wear costly pearls. There's going to be a whole lot of ladies in the churches, a whole lot of churches <laughs> <We're> gonna... <laughs> in trouble. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you go by this. Yes. But so what's what's the universal heart behind this cultural law that, that Paul is addressing? Mm-hmm. Um, it is, it's the one of modesty. Yeah, That's gonna ba- the heart behind here's it. Here's one that's going to bake your noodle. <laughs> okay? Yeah, yeah. When you expand, when you, modesty is contextual. Yes. Yes. You go to certain places when yeah, you, yeah. De- this is the, now you're getting to mission stuff and yeah. the heart of a missionary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get into other countries um, where, and of course with modern age, it's not as much, but for many years, you walk around the country and a woman would walk around without, without any top and mm-hmm. it's not sexual by any right. shape or right, form. Right, 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 right. You right. know, just, yep. be, it's, it's not considered immodest right. because that's, it's their so, culture. Right. It's, so yeah. it's, now here's the thing. There's still biblical standards we need to be walking by. <laughs> you know? yeah, I just yeah, yeah. use that as an extreme example yeah, yeah, of yeah. modesty. It does have context. And so what we have to do is find the heart. And the heart is we want, you know, we want our men and women to operate with propriety, with modesty, and selflessness, really selflessness, because you know, and and that's something I think that is lost in our American culture because we're a very selfish culture. Yeah, nothing wrong with wearing pearls or earrings or expensive clothes. Right, right, right. It's but the, the heart word, behind it. The heart behind it, and what the Word of God is saying is, you should dress yourself to and be selfless with it, not flaunt your wealth, not right, flaunt right, what you right. have, your resources. And we're all about ostentatious living. We're all about flaunting our wealth in the United States. Yeah. That's something that we've lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you have cultural things. One thing we need to factor is all Scripture exists in context. Mm-hmm. Luke is, exists in context. All of Paul's writing exists in context. So Paul is writing to a church. He's writing to a young man. He's writing to Timothy, who's pastoring the church at Ephesus, who's never pastored before. He's never pastored a church before because churches didn't exist you had synagogues, completely different. You have this new way of gathering and worship, a new way of worship being formed right then and there. And they have no clue what's going on. And so what Paul is doing, and this I talked about this yesterday mm-hmm. or on Sunday, um, he's he's looking at everything and the, the chaos of creation. Yeah. And Luke is spurning the chaos of creation. He's talking to Gentile believers saying, you got to get out there and you, you know, the Holy Spirit is for women, it's for minorities, it's for poor people, rich people, all people. And um, so Paul is going, we got to put some guardrails in this on this thing so we don't flame out yeah, he's yeah, trying yeah. to give best yeah. practices i think you but, said on sunday they're arguing from from just different sides of the same yeah, coin yeah they're fighting the same battle but just two different fronts yeah, yeah 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 um so paul is always correcting he's always having to correct and help young pastors know how to correct and lead and that's what we have here so let's let's talk if i can talk specifically because we are running out of time here okay. um so i think what you have to do is is look at this like okay um, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach. One thing we need to we need to factor and just put it in our in our brains, our, our drawer. Of Paul is the only New Testament writer who will distinguish at times his own personal opinion and the word of the Lord. He'll say, "This is this is what not I think." A, yeah, this is Paul, not the Lord. And yeah. times he'll say, "Not I, but the Lord." Yeah, yeah. So, and he's, he's, he does that a lot. He's a pretty opinionated guy. So we got to ask ourselves, is this really um, from the Lord or is this Paul's opinion? Mm-hmm. And is he addressing a specific issue? Because the understanding, if you do some study, um, the book, the book, the church of in Corinth and Ephesus had issues with, you have women who are not allowed to learn, who are not allowed to study the word of God, who are not allowed to participate 
now they're fully enfranchised. Mm -hmm. And so they're talking to each other. They're asking questions. They're trying to catch up. Yeah. And they're doing it in a public setting. And so Paul's going, we got to rein this in because nothing's getting done because everybody's talking. Right, right, right. So you have that. Um, What about the uh, save through childbearing? What the... you got some thoughts on that? <laughs> no. You ain't gonna touch that? Ah, I don't. Come on, you can give a, take a swing at it. Pastor Adam? No, it's all right. It's a tough one. Okay. Yeah. Here's the thing there. Is Paul really saying that the only women who are going to be saved and receive the gift of eternal life are ones who bear children? I think we all can say, no, I, we don't think that's what he's talking right. about. Right. Right? Yes. What is he talking about here? Well, one of the key is, is looking into the Greek word uh, saved. Mm-hmm. What that means, I'm trying to, I did this a few days ago, so um, in my study, but it, it has, you know, salvation connotations, but it also has, they will be sustained, mm-hmm. they will be blessed, they will be nurtured. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I think what Paul is. It's not an individual. Well, what I think what he's talking about, we got to understand the context. Mm-hmm. In this context, and because the New Testament church was having this issue with their Greek widows, in this ancient context, yes. a woman's only hope of surviving into old age is by having a, not just children, but having a son. No, oh, yeah, yeah. Having a son. Um, and so if you don't have a son, you're, you're toast. Yeah. You have no way of making a living you're destitute for poverty i mean you're destined for poverty and most likely an early death because of the malnutrition and all the things yeah. that come along yeah. with extreme poverty so he he's saying that i think in the context of this new family called the church mm-hmm. a woman is safe she's blessed she's sustained our widows are sustained um through spiritual childbearing does that make sense? No, absolutely it does. You know, no, no, no. I think that's what he's, and this is just my interpretation. It's through spiritual child marrying, spiritual sons, through this new empowerment of the Holy Spirit, a woman can now, you know, and it, and it ties back to Jesus on the cross with John, woman, behold your mother, mother, yes. behold your son. No, which I, is, I, yes, I, I, I absolutely agree. And the agree. thing is, Jesus has brothers. Yes, he I, has, and, she has physical heirs, yeah. but he's giving the responsibility to a spiritual son, yeah. John. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have this, you know, when you factor in Acts, you factor in what's said in the Gospels, the cultural context of the, just the, the death sentence yeah. of being a widow without a yeah. son. Yeah, He is saying if, you know, if they continue in faith, stay plugged into the family, love and holiness, self-control... You know, they will be sustained, blessed, nurtured through this new family of spiritual childbirth. Yeah, no, I I, I think that's right. Because you can almost take any verse in Scripture and isolate it and get off the rails oh, man. I mean, a million ways to Sunday. Do you know what I mean? So you, taking that and then like, let's go out a little bit and a little bit further and yeah. let's get to the heart of God and really well, hit at you, this thing. You, I think that. And you touch on something, and I think we'll end on this. When, you are, when we are reading Scripture, we have to think of each verse like uh, a pebble dropped in a pond. Mm. The circle starts small, and then it expands out. Yeah, yeah. So we take a verse, and we say, okay, I'm going to think about how to interpret this verse. Okay, now I'm going to put it within the context of this passage. Yeah, yeah. How do I interpret it in co- against that backdrop? Now I expand out to the chapter. Mm-hmm. Okay, now I expand to the, the maybe the section of that book. How do I interpret this in the backdrop of that? Now the entire book. How does this fit into the whole writing of the book of First yes, Timothy? Yes, this is this is good. This is how yeah. we should be reading our Bibles every and, day. And then we think, okay, how does this fit within the context of the New Testament? And then how does this fit within the context yeah. of you have the to. entire Word yeah, of God? The you entire have counsel. to. So um, yeah, yeah. No, that's 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 good. That's a perfect way to. To end. So I think, you know, if you if you look at, if you just isolate this passage, this can be a troubling passage. But if you look at it against the backdrop of all of other Paul's other other Pauline writings, yeah, yeah. other theological 
New Testament theologians, the mm-hmm. gospel writers, um, the other writers of epistles, and the, the whole council of the Word of God. Yeah. You can see it kind of fit in. You, you, you to have it. to, and because I'm telling you, like going to First Corinthians, if you if you pick that apart verse by verse, I mean, you could have you would have the wildest church if you took every one of those as like oh, yeah. hard lines. You know what I mean? You have to put it in this context and wrestle with it. Like and you, you got to wrestle with what what's cultural and yeah. what's the universal heart behind these like cultural that. situations. I like that. I'm going to borrow that. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's it. I think we've gone over time a little bit, but that's okay because <laughs> it was a good discussion. Hopefully everybody uh, enjoyed it. Once again, thank you so much for tuning in to the Life at Crossroads podcast. I'm Pastor Mark. With me is Pastor Adam. And uh, we would love to get your thoughts. Subscribe to this podcast on Spotify or wherever you get your podcast. If you have an idea for us that you would like us to address, you can email us at podcast dot or at podcast at crossroads dot church. Yeah. So all right. Sign us off at Pastor Adam. Uh that's Pastor Mark and Pastor Adam saying uh, we'll see you next time.